Okay, good morning everyone. We're going to start our lecture four on measuring performance and analysis tools. And there's some slides at the end that we're going to talk about, but we're not going to go through together. Now remember, first off, project one is due tomorrow night before midnight. So make sure you're taking advantage of the autograder. Make sure you're getting your submits in. Get your test files submitted with the input files that we can give you points for. They'll also give you feedback if you get your own test files wrong. You will see us reminding you of things like this throughout the semester. The reason is we do want to help you keep up. We do want you to succeed. We don't want to fail students. We want you to succeed in this class. Um, if you're wondering why the first project is so quick with the due date is a couple reasons. One is we want it done and graded and late days used and everything else before we get to the point where the drop date is coming around. We want you to be able to decide to make a decision how you're doing uh, with before the W date comes up. We don't want people to use their spring, you know, one of their two attempts at 281 in the spring and get a W and just, you know, and discover that a week or two from now when it's too late to drop. Um, and the real reason here is that with spring being at double speed, we want to make sure that if the only reason that you're not succeeding is because of the pace, that you figure that out quickly. And the following projects are going to be more involved. They're going to be more difficult and it was the best place to, to, to spend the time where we can spend a little bit just a day over a week on the first one and then almost two weeks on each of the other projects. Now there's a couple slides in here about general project tips. So you, says your you say your code's running too slow, what should you do? Well, first make sure you're using dash 03. When you're on Cane and you're using our make file, or if you're at the bash prompt on Windows or the terminal prompt on Xcode, if you're using our make file, you should see the dash 03 on every line when you compile. And the make file we gave you does that by default. One note about that is that if you're compiling inside of Visual Studio or inside of Xcode and running it with the debugger, that's great. That's awesome. But the thing you have to be careful of is that the uh, default build inside of an IDE is a debug build. And because of that, you want to be careful with what you think of the time. So because the, the timing can be um, slow when you're running with a debug build. Uh, let's see other things. Uh, you can you can run time uh, the time command which we talked about previously. The um, use the sample data that we gave you. Use one of the larger ones that we gave you to test with. Uh, review the project one STL and U slides review the optimization tips document, make sure you've got sync with studio false at the top of main, um, use backslash n. The only time you should be using endl is when you're about to exit due to an error. Other than that, use backslash n. And there's a bunch of notes about why these uh, work inside of the uh, optimization tips document. Um, use the right data structure. You could use a linked list to be your sale container, but it, a deck is going to be better. Other possibilities. Now there's a bunch of things in here that people say, and we've got a note here, no, don't do these things, at least not at first. The, the 1D vector, I would definitely never do that. Some of those other things are good. If you're running into trouble, come to Prophes Hours and get some help. Uh, when do you need to flush an output stream is right before you uh, exit. So if you're doing an exit call, that's when you want to make sure a stream gets flushed. Flushing means the output is forced to go to the screen uh, before anything else happens. 
So when you're about to do an, uh, a C error and an exit, C error should use the NDL, and then um, C out should just use backslash N. Uh, now, you can run the using time, you can run using perf and open things up and look for analysis. There's also, so perf will help with time. And James Dewitt did this example slide from a previous semester where we had a uh, escape from a ship detention facility and your trusty robot companion was programming the route to get you out. But it still holds true for this one. Um, if you're spending too much time on, say, reading it, if reading the input is the huge bulk of your time, then that uh, shouldn't happen. Now, one caveat about using perf is that uh, perf is great for you. Perf is great for, hey, I timed my code, I ran perf, I made some changes, and I ran perf again, and hey, now my, my read function is using much less percent of time than it used to be. That's great. That's a perfect way for you to use it. For us, it doesn't help for you to show us perf output because the perf output, one snapshot of perf output, doesn't mean anything to me unless I dig through your code and understand the organization. And if that's the case, I'd rather just go straight to the code than look at the perf output and the code. Now, if you're going over memory, there's a set of lines here. This, well, this is all one line. Um, so this is all one line using Valgrind and an add-on tool for Valgrind called Massif. And uh, a massif is like a, a large geographic feature, like not quite a cliff, not quite a mountain, but somewhere in between there. So a massif is basically a large profile on the horizon, if you were to see it. Um, and what massif does is it gives you a, an output that shows you how your profile, how the horizon looks for memory as time goes by. And so if you look at snapshots of memory and you look at like through the file, you can see what's using up the bulk of your memory. Oh, look at this. 97% of the memory was the ship. This, this would correspond to like our treasure map. So there's a peak and there's the main bulk of the data. Now, he ran it with a mistake in it and looked at it and said, hey, wait a minute. Why do I have three copies of my ship, or in our case, the treasure map? Why do I have three copies of the big multidimensional vector data structure? Well, maybe because you passed it by value and then passed it by value again, and you ended up with three copies of it instead of one. Um, one test case, one thing I would suggest on time in project one specifically is make sure you check for the treasure when you put it in to the container, into the deck, not when you take it out. Um, and the other things that we mentioned, like the um, making sure you're passing things by reference, um, making sure that you're, you want to make sure you do not ever want to do a linear search in here. Uh, like, you don't want to say, hey, have I ever gone to location row 123, column 750 before? I don't know. Let's search this 1D vector of every place I've de been. Let's do a linear search of that. That's a terrible thing to do. You want to be able to do it in O of 1 time, determine if you've been there before or not. Yes, yeah, so because you've got about almost two weeks for projects 2, 3, 4. And come to Prophecy Hours today. We'll be able to talk about more things and, uh, and go over particular people's code. No, you should be doing about the same per week. You just get two weeks for the projects. OK. Now, when you're going over memory, think about what you're doing. So given the results of MAFSIF, what's the most important data structure to worry about? So the data read in, generally, in, in Project 1 is the problem. So in Project 1, you want to look at the memory that you read in 
you really only need two bytes per location. For every row and column, you really only need two bytes. One character for what you read in, one character to help with the backtracing. When you look at also the data go that goes into the deck, the sale container and search container, make sure those are not bigger than they need to be. Those need a row and column. The 2D vector does not need a row and column stored within the 2D vector. If you had a big map, think of this. If I had a big 5,000 by 5,000 map, do I really need 5,000 copies of zero in row zero and 5,000 copies of zero in column zero? That's a huge waste of memory. So we want to have one data structure for the map, one data structure for the deck, they should be different data structures and contain different things. What's in the deck should be things like either unsigned int or uint32 underscore t. Those are both eight byte or both four bytes, 32 bits. Um, also, you could do something like um, I'm going to add a C error statement like C error my sale, sale container dot size. And I'll do that through my while loop and just keep an eye on it. Now you've got to be careful. If we send it to Sierra, the auto grader will not grade it, but it does take time. If this is inside of a loop, it takes time. So this is something you want to do for like your own testing, but remove it before you submit to the auto grader. The auto grader will not grade Sierra output, but it does use up time. But if you do this and you see that, hey, my sale container never ever goes down in size, there's something wrong there. The sale container should go up and down. It should go up, down, up, down, up, down. But if you see that the, Sierra, the uh, size of the deck keeps growing and never ever goes down, there's a good indication you've got something wrong there. Uh, yeah. Also, don't worry about single variables. Like with a loop variable, what I tend to do is be consistent. If I've got an unsigned int that's the row or column, then I'm going to use an unsigned int for my loop variable. But I'm not doing that because of memory. I'm doing it because sticking with the same type of variables produces less problems, where I don't get warnings about um, combining int uh, signed and unsigned integers. Don't worry about single variables inside a main. You want to worry about the big data structures. And the things that are bigger than a few bytes should be passed around by reference or by const reference. Did you reserve or resize on the 2D vector? With the DAC, you can't reserve or resize there. We don't know how big it'll become. Maybe in my 5,000 by 5,000, there'll be a million things in the DAC at some point. Or maybe the treasure is two steps away from the start and I'll find it without the deck ever going above the size of five. So we don't want to try to guess on the um, deck, but we know exactly how big the 2D vector needs to be. Now, a little bit of notation from last time. Um, remember, we're going to be talking about complexity today. We're going to be talking about um, how many steps it takes to run some set of code. Now we can look at complexity either analytically, working out what is the big O notation, what's our recurrence relation say, or we can look at measuring it through creating a program and timing it. Now in this class we tend to do both. We want to think about the complexity before we write the code, but we also have to look at the code, do some empirical testing with actual data, and get a, a real estimate of how long our code is taking, not just how long our algorithm says it should have taken. So one thing we can do is we can look at 
adding code to our code to do the timing programmatically. Now this one changes with the language. C and C++ have a way to do it. Other languages have ways to do it also. But this one changes with every program with every programming language. Now what we gave you here is some code uh, written by Merck Mill, who teaches 280 and 490 um, and a few other things. And he wrote a timer class that we're going to use. So this makes use of the Chrono library. This stuff is not going to be on the exam, but we're going to use it coming up real soon. So we've got a timer object. So we've created a timer class. Remember, if we don't say otherwise, these things are private. So we've got some private member variables, the current time and the elapsed time. And we've got a constructor that says, set my current time to the default, set my elapsed time to zero. I've got to start the timer function. We've got to stop the timer function. We've got a reset that says, hey, set the elapsed time back to zero. And we've got a way to retrieve the number of seconds. So then we've got an example over here of, hey, I'm going to create a timer. I'll start the timer. Then I'll do some stuff. I'll call some function that does some, some uh, co more complex code. And then I'll stop the timer and print out how long stuff one, how long task one took to finish. Then we reset the timer because I want to get a separate time. I want to say, hey, here's the time it took for, for stuff one. Here's the time it took for part two. So I want to do a reset in between to go back to zero time elapsed. Then I say, start, uh, start the timer, start it now, do stuff two, stop the timer. Then we can print out how long it took. The uh, timer does take time to run this code, to start and stop and reset. And so we've got to be careful about doing this too often. We don't want to uh, start and stop the timer inside of a loop. We'd be better off like here. I start the timer, I run the complex code with the loops, then I stop the timer. So if you're turning the timer on and off too much, you're, you're timing that also effectively. Now what we're going to do is here, I've got some code. Um, I'm going to, I've got a terminal ready. I've logged into Kane and we're going to go grab some code and we're going to play with it and see what's going on. So now just one second, I got to change my source over here. Bash shell. Okay. Hopefully this works out. Okay. Uh, hopefully it's not too small to see. Let me see. It does look a little small. Do I have a way to change my font size? Aha. Let's go a little bit bigger. Okay, that looks like a more reasonable size. Hopefully this will come through well. So I've got... Oops, so that's my local folder for that. I logged out of Kane. Okay. Okay, there we go. I got nothing in the folder. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to type wget and then our link goo.gl slash and then that's g capital O capital N lowercase v capital C and a zero. And then I say dash capital O says output to search.cpp. All right, so now we should say, hey, uh, I've got a document saving to search.cpp, about 4K bytes file. There we go, we got our file. All right, now the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to make sure I'm running with the right version of G. So I've got mine set up correctly to use 6.2.0. If you don't have that set up, you would do the module load GCC 6.2.0. And I'm not going to do that because mine's already loaded. But if you've got to make sure you got the right version here. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compile this. So G++, I didn't bother with a make file for this. I'd have to get that also, etc. Uh, G++ minus standard equals C++ 
plus plus one z dash o three. That's optimized for speed. Search.cpp and output file named search. All right, so that should build me an executable named search. Looks good. Okay, so now we've got an example in the slide, which you can refer to. So it says we want to do a linear search or a binary search. So actually, if we just type dot slash search, it says, hey, you must specify B or L for the type of search, binary or linear, and the number of items on the command line. Okay, dot slash search. Uh, let's, do, let's do like a linear search of a million items. All right, so we run that. And it says, okay, I found about half of them. And we'll look at why it's half in a minute. It should be around half. And it took about, uh, so filling the vector took 0.004 seconds. Doing the searching took about a tenth of a second. Okay, let's do it with 10 million. Okay, filling the vector took about 10 times longer. That's what we'd expect. And searching took more than 10 times longer. We'd expect it to go from like a tenth of a second to about a second, but it took four and a half. Now at four and a half seconds, I don't want to go too much bigger on that. Let's do it. Let's do a binary search. A million elements takes about the same time to fill the vector, and it takes um, about the same time to do the search. That's not good. Let's make it bigger. About the same time to fill the vector as the linear with that size and about the same time to do the search. Okay, something's wrong here. Binary searching shouldn't be taking that long. Okay, so let's go through here. And so James Jewett wrote this a while ago, so we've got the timer class, so we can skip past the timer class. That's not the problem. That's copied directly from the slides. And then we've got a linear search. Okay, it says performs a straightforward linear search through the input vector, should theoretically have a O of n time, and it contains a bug. Okay, so we'll look at that. What about binary search? Performs a binary search, contains a bug. Okay, we'll get back to that. Let's look at main. Okay, so here in main, it says we've got a timer, warn them if the, if the command line is wrong, we did we didn't use get uh, get up long here we wanted to make it a short quick program so we figure out should we do a binary search depends on the first letter of the first parameter number of items is the second parameter fill the vector so I start it I reserve the vector size I do all my filling and it, oh it says look at this I fill the vector with uh, values two times I so I fill it with 0 2 4 8 16 etc so I fill it with a bunch of even values, stop the timer, say how long, test the search. Okay, so I do a reset, start the timer, do the search, stop the timer. Okay, so that should be the time to search. Oh, whoop, looks, looks like my reset or my return here is indented differently. Okay. So now, so this calls test search. Let's look up here at test search. Okay, test search says um, we're going to do a binary. Are we going to do a binary search, true or false? the vector that we're going to search, and how many searches we should do. Okay, we use a random number generator. What we're doing with the random number generator is we're picking values on a, it says a uniform distribution of integers from zero to two times the vector size. So remember, let's say we had a vector size of 10. A vector size of 10 would have been filled with 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, uh, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So it would have been filled with even numbers. We're going to generate a number in the range 0 to 19, actually, 0 to 2 times the size. This is an open, uh, a closed interval, open interval. So 0 is included, 2 times the size is not included. So we're rolling a random number uniformly or equally, uh, equally likely distribution of 0 through 19 inclusive. So we get a number 0 to 19, that's why it should end up finding about half of them. It's filled with even numbers, and we generate a random number that could be even or odd. And then we do the search. If it found it, we count that up. So it says, oh, if it returned something other than negative 1. So if it returned something other than negative 1, we found it, we add it up, 
And then when we're done, we print how many we found. Okay, that looks fine. Well, the other ones say there's bugs in them. So let's look up at the linear search. So the linear search code here says there's a bug. It says, let's pass a vector, let's pass a value, let's go through every index. If I find what I'm looking for, I immediately return. And if I go through the whole thing, I return negative one. So what's the problem with this code? It's taking too long and binary search is even worse. What's wrong with this code? I've got a vector. I search every index. I return if I, as soon as I find it. I don't go all the way to the end even if I found it. As soon as I find the value, I return it. The problem is actually not in the body of the function. The problem is in this line. In this line, I've got a vector that I'm passing by value. So let's go down and fix that. So now, if I put in an ampersand here, we're going to test this code out. We're going to compile it and see what happens. And I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a Unix trick here. Exclamation point, which people in the know, we like to call it bang, bang G. Exclamation point G says, redo the last command that started with the letter G, which happened to be G++. So it shows me here, I do exclamation G, it shows me what it's going to do, and then it says, hey, wait a minute, uh, you've got something uh, discards qualifiers. Aha, binding const to reference type not const discards the const. So your reaction, the reaction of many students here is, Oh, no, there's const in places there shouldn't be. Let's go delete the word const. That's the wrong reaction. The correct reaction is I should have added const when I passed this by reference. Because remember, I'm going to go forward page here, test search receives the vector by const reference. Test search promised not to modify it. And then it called linear search. Linear search did not promise not to modify it. That broke the promise that test search made. So, like I said, what students will tend to do is say, ooh, let's go remove const from test search. The correct response is let's add const to the linear search. So test search promised to not modify it. We promise not to modify it. We don't need to modify it to find something. Okay, let's check binary search. Binary search. Looks like it's got the same problem here. It should be const reference vec. Okay, so we're going to pass the vector by const reference. We pass the value by value. It's just an integer. It's faster to pass this integer by value than it is to pass it by reference. So then it says, let's figure out the high and low, the minimum and maximum indices. Let's go and uh, find, uh, let's go find the middle. If we found the value, let's return the index. And if it's less, let's limit the high end, otherwise limit the low end and return negative one. Okay, that looks good. Every, excuse me, everything other than the uh, parameter to the function looks good. So let's save that and we'll go repeat our G++ line. Okay, didn't fail this time. So now let's redo, I'm going to clear the screen. Let's redo our million linear searches and let's up it again. Now that time, okay, we went, we, went, we multiplied the size times 10 and it went from like 0.025 seconds to 0.388. This is actually, we're down in the range here where we're getting a little bit of variability just due to the size. Like if I do it with a million a couple times, okay, that's pretty consistent. Okay, uh, 10 million. Okay, it's taking a little bit longer than 10 times, but not too bad. And if I up this to 100 million, filling the vector takes 10 times longer. Searching takes about 10 times longer. All right, now let's try it with binary search. Let's do a binary search with a million. Uh-huh. Okay, the time now 
is displayed in scientific notation if so small. Okay, let's go bigger. Okay, so 10 million. Okay, 0. 0.00017 seconds. All right, let's go bigger. So 100 million. Now, look at that. It did not get bigger by a factor of 10. It got bigger by about a factor of 2. Why a factor of 2? Let's think about this. If it gets bigger by 10, what is the log base 2 of 10? Is 3. It should have, the time should have gone up by about a factor of 3. But hey, this is so small, we're at a, we're at a pretty small time as it is. Okay, let's make it bigger. Okay, that's... Okay, so now it did take 10 times longer to fill it. Um, went from 0.5 down up to 6 seconds, so it took about 12 times longer to fill it. And it took about one and a half times longer. So we're still getting a really, really fast time here on our binary search. It's definitely binary now. And we're, we're getting a little bit of, of um, it's not quite what we'd expect, like around three times, but it's still so small. We're in the uh, tens, hundredths, thousandths. We're in the four ten thousandths of a second range. We're kind of at the limit of timing, actually. We can try to go bigger. And we're going to run into two problems here. One is it would take like a minute to fill it. The other is we got a segmentation fault. We can't make a vector that big on K. It just doesn't give us enough memory to create a vector that big. Okay, now one thing I want to show you is what happens if we run Valgrind? And I don't want this to take too long. What I want to do is I want to see the output from Valgrind. Okay, so the first part of it here is basically Valgrind saying, I'm starting, here's the output from your program, and here's the output at the end. Aha, whole total heap usage, two allocations, two freeze, about 400,000-ish bytes. Well, let's see. I said I need 100,000, um, 100,000 times four bytes each for integers. So about 400,000 of that was the vector. The other 72,000 was other stuff that we did. C out, etc. Now, what I want, and it says all heap blocks were freed, no leaks are possible. What I want to do is I want to make it leak memory so we can see what it says. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here to the bottom and I'm going to replace my return zero with exit zero. Okay, bang g says recompile that. Bang v says rebutton valgrind, the last command that started with v. And there we go. Okay. Definitely, okay, so in use at exit, 400,000 bytes. So the vector did not get freed. Remember above it said two allocs, two frees. Here it's two allocs, one free, and still reachable, meaning the memory is there. We could get to it at the moment. Okay, rerun with leak check full. Okay, so we're, we're going to add an option to the valgrind. Minus minus leak check equals full. Okay, so then show it. And it says, um, uh, oh, to see them rerun with leak check full and show leak kinds equals all. Okay, we'll add another option. Minus minus show leak kinds equals all. And put a space back in there. All right, let's try that again. Okay, 400,000 bytes in one block are still reachable, and they were allocated by this memory address is the culprit, main, in search. That's not very useful. I want a line number. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our compile line. We're going to change the O3 to a G3. If you're using our make file, you would say make space debug. And, oh, let's do what the make file does. Let's call this search, whoops, debug. So I'm going to make a new copy of the executable with a debug build instead of optimized, and I'm going to give it a different name. Now we're going to rerun the valgrind with search 
underscore debug and see what it says now. Okay, now I could make my screen bigger, but then it might make the video weirder. Um, let's read this. So we'll learn how to read this. Um, so here's basically a block of, this is basically a call stack. This is showing what was called. Let's look at this error from bottom to top. Search.cpp line 128 called into vector some include file, which calls into some other vector include file line 1200. I don't want to look at those. I want to look at the highest line of code in the search in the call stack that is mine. Search.cpp line 128. So we'll go back to line 128 and Let's turn on line numbers to make it a little easier. Yep, there's line 128. Yep, that's the line that did the vector reserve. So Valgrind can't tell you who didn't delete it. It can only show you who allocated it. But in a more complex program with more data structures, this would be more helpful. Really, the problem is this exit. Exit here should be return zero. So now if we do that, we'll save it, recompile it, rerun Valgrind, and now it says all heaps were freed, no leaks are possible, there's nothing to show. Okay, so that's it for the demo there. So that was what we just did. Um, here's an example of using the perf tool and this is an example that we grabbed from, uh, we we're trying to look at something complex that we, wasn't a solution to one of our projects. So James Jewett grabbed this from the 280 slides of the uh, image processing program. So what this tell you is the children column means this function and all functions it calls. Self means just this function. And you can use when you're running this, you can use the up and down arrow keys and press enter on one of those lines and it will expand it. It'll open up and show you what's inside of it. And oh, other important thing to know, whoops, that's wrong symbol, Q. Q, if you type Q in, it quits out of the perf tool. Okay. So now, if we're launching a program, here's other things we can do. Instead of modifying the code, we can ask the command prompt to help us. So instead of just running our program, we're going to run user bin time and our program. For instance, I could do like user bin time dot slash search binary a million. And it'll give me output like this to tell me what happened. So let's break that. Uh, oh, let's uh, before we do that, we'll do another example and then we'll go break down that time. Here's me running a Unix program that was just basically copying from uh, an infinite source of zeros to an infinite sink of throwing stuff away. And I stopped it and it said, gave me this information back. And this is the important line. That's the feedback from the time command. Now, here we copied the line up here. So what it's telling you when you use the time command is first, user time. That's the time spent by your program. System time is how long the operating system spent doing stuff for you. And then the elapsed time is the wall clock time. The percent CPU is just add together the first two, divide by the third one. Now, notice here, we didn't get 100% of the CPU. Wait a minute. I was running, wasn't I? Well, the issue is that as the operating system and as your program perceives time is different from wall time. Because what happens is in a modern operating system, which is running multiple programs, the operating system gives your program a CPU and says, here, program, start running. Your program starts running, and then a certain amount of time later, which is decided on by the operating system, the operating system tells your program to stop. And then it maybe does some other stuff, and then it says, hey, program, start up again. And your program continues running. 
your program from its viewpoint, it started and it finished. It doesn't know that it was stopped once every thousandth of a second or whatever the uh, amount of time is. It's called the quanta. And again, not on the exam. The quanta is how long the operating system gives you to run before yanking the, the CPU away from you and giving it to someone else. From your program's point of view, it started, it ran, it finished. From the operating system's point of view, you started and stopped many times before you finished because there were other things that needed to be done. There was virus checking, there was backups, there was the browser had to update. All kinds of things were happening on your computer at the same time. So that's why you generally don't see a CPU utilization of 100 because you get stopped and started all the time. Oh, actually, we already went through this slide. I did this one uh, just knowing it was going to come up. So we already did the, uh, the valve grind and leak checking, etc. Now, when we get empirical results, one thing we should do is plot them out. Let's look at them. So I plotted them out for some theoretical program. I plotted four points with input sizes. This is my input size, n. This is the time. And it looks, hey, it's not quite a line, but it looks like I could draw a line between those. Well, those four points here are the same four points that are here. But in this one, I went further out on my size and now I can see, hey, this thing that looked like maybe it was O of n, this is starting to look more like O of n squared, maybe, as I plot it out for a larger n. So for small inputs, we may not see the real asymptotic complexity. We may have to go out further. Now, what happens, there's a lot of text on here. Let's go through each section. What happens if our experimental results are worse than our theoretical prediction. So we got exponential when we expected linear, or better yet, example we just did. We got linear time when we expected binary for a binary search. So one thing could be an error in the complexity analysis. Maybe my big O was wrong. Maybe because the, the program was so complex I made a mistake in my big O notation. Uh, another one could be an error in coding. Do I have an extra loop? Did I pass something by value when I should have passed it by reference? Other things like that. I could have made a simple programming mistake when I implemented it. All right, what if our experimental results are better than our predictions? What if I expected, say, n squared in my analysis and I got O of, say, n log n would be a more reasonable than exponential to linear. But what if I expected n squared and I'm seeing something that's more like n log n? Well, one thing is maybe my experiment didn't fit the worst case. Maybe my input file just happened to be best case. Well, then maybe I could see something exponential running linear time because the answer was right there at the beginning every time. So maybe my data wasn't a worst case data. Maybe, again, maybe I made a, an error in my complexity analysis. Maybe I made an error in my analytical measurements. Maybe I used a debug build when I should have used an optimized build. Maybe I didn't make the end big enough to see the real trend. Um, maybe I didn't implement the whole algorithm. Maybe I didn't finish the program. Maybe I'm timing the first two parts and I forgot to write the code. I was, I was so excited the first two parts wrote uh, worked when I wrote them, I didn't write the code for the third part. Maybe as I was implementing it, I chose a better algorithm than when I analyzed it. So maybe when I was doing my analysis, I said, oh, you know, I'll just use a simple um, uh, bubble sort here, or maybe I'll use a selection sort here. And then when I implemented it, I said, oh yeah, wait a minute, I just saw a merge sort the other day, I'm gonna implement merge sort. Well then, the merge sort is n log n, but I had analyzed it for bubble sort being n, n squared. 
So maybe I've got a better algorithm than I chose initially. So now I've got to go back and redo my analysis. Okay, what if my experimental data is matching my prediction, but it just runs too slow? Maybe we've got something like a compiler flag issue, or we're running it inside of Xcode or Visual Studio, and we're in a debug build. And when we're in a debug build, it's going to take a lot longer. Uh, the other thing is Valgrind. When we run Valgrind, uh, Valgrind doesn't actually run your program. Valgrind is a simulator. It simulates running your program. And that simulation takes time. So if you've got, for instance, if you're trying to, say, uh, figure out why you're getting a problem with a big, big test file. So you want to see line numbers, so you do a debug build. You want to know where the seg fault occurs, so you run it with Valgrind. It's going to take maybe half an hour to run that program that otherwise would take a minute. So uh, when, you're, when you're using like Valgrind and a debug build, it's going to take a long time for a big test case. So other things you can do if, if we are back to the slide. So the, other, the last thing here could be look for optimizations for the constant factor. So if it's taking too long, but it's still matching our predictions, maybe I could go from 5M to 3M. They're still both O of M, but it makes a difference in runtime. 5N and 3N have the same big O notation, but they do have different real-world runtimes. Now, here's a question that we're going to come back to in the near future is, hey, suppose I want to write a function to do a power, and we're going to make it simple. We're not going to use doubles. We're not going to use fractions. We're going to use just integers, and we're going to use some integer to an integer power, and we're not going to let it be negative powers. So we're going to do like 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1st, 2 squared, 2 to the 15th, and we want to calculate the power of an integer to an unsigned integer power. Now the obvious solution is, hey, I started with my product of 2, and I do n minus 1 multiplications. I'll get the Less obvious solution is to get this done with log multiplications. So think about this. We're going to come back to this one, I believe, next lecture. Unless I'm on the wrong lecture and Professor Darden already did this one last lecture. Okay, so if we're doing an integer to an integer power, we can just do the loop here. I start out with a result is equal to x. If result is equal to x, I need this loop to run n minus 1 times. I multiply out, and I return the result. Works fine, O of n. Now, let's look at recursion. So, remember our recursion. Function is recursive if it calls itself. So, iterative this is with a loop. Recursion is when you call yourself. So now, here we've got a, an iterative version. This one is very slightly different than the previous iterative version because I started at 1, I needed to do the multiplication n times. It's still O of n. We multiply it n times, and then when we're done, we return the result. Here's the recursive one. So the recursive one, let's look at the code before we talk about the complexity. I say if n is equal to equal to 0, that's return 1. That's a base case. Anything to the 0th power is 1. Otherwise, I return x times x to the n minus 1 power. So if you want to calculate like x to the fifth, that's 2 times x to the fourth. x to the fourth is the same as 2 times x to the third, etc. So I'm going to make the recursive calls here. Now we can see here we're going to get the right answer. What's the time complexity of the one on the right? Let's get to that in a minute. Is the function on the right, let's answer a more easy question, is the function on the right tail recursive? Does it return immediately upon finishing the recursive call? 
Well, before the recursive call, we do the n minus 1. But after the recursive call is over, we've still got a pending multiplication. So this one is not tail recursive. This one is going to use the call stack. Now, I would expect that if I make n recursive calls, it should end up being O of n time, but we're going to need another tool to analyze that one. We're going to come back to that one in the future. So, what we're going to talk about is a recurrence relation. Now, we can describe here at the top, we have a recurrence relationship to describe how we calculate x to the n. So, x to the n is equal to 1 when n is equal to 0. Otherwise, it's equal to x times x to the n minus 1. So, we've got a computation uh, represented in the recurrence relation. Now, in the bottom, we've got a recurrence relationship for the time. It says the time that it takes to solve a problem of size n is equal to some constant amount of time when we've got a base case. Or, if it's not a base case, it's going to take a recursive amount of time with a smaller problem plus some constant amount of time. So now those C1 and C0, where did those come from? Oops, I want to go the other way. Okay, so on this slide, where are the C1 and the C0? Now, if we're in a base case, the if and the return 1, that's basically C0. What's in C1? Well, in C1, line 10 still has to happen. So C1 is made up of line 10 and line 13. Well, not everything in line 13, though, but part of it's a recursive call. But we can think about, hey, I've got this multiplication is part of the C1. The subtraction is part of the C1. Actually making the recursive call is part of C1. All of those things are part of C1. They're constant amount of time. The variable amount of time is the recursive call. How long does it take power to run? That's the part here. That's the recursive call. So we say the time to solve a problem of size n is equal to the problem, uh, the time to solve a slightly smaller problem plus some constant amount of time for the subtraction multiplication, stuff like that. So how do we solve this? So one thing we can do is we can do the what's called the recursion tree method, which is in CLRS, or we can use the substitution method, which is what I'm going to show you. So what we're going to do is we're going to write out the equation for t of n, and we're going to substitute back into it, and we're going to look for a pattern. So We've got our code over here. We've got our recurrence relationship. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the recurrence relation without the base case, because we're talking about the complicated part. When I'm on the complicated part, when I've got t of n is equal to t of n minus 1 plus c1. Now, I want to get rid of this equation on the right-hand side. I don't want an equation on the right-hand side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in from the original equation. Now, it might help if we show this with a different set of variables. What if I said, what if I told you t of x is equal to t of x minus 1 plus c1? Well, now what I want to do is I want to substitute in for... Oh, wait a Erase here really carefully. Okay, I want to substitute in for this part. Well, this part is equal to that part when x, x is equal to n minus 1. See, so n minus 1 is what's over here. n minus 1 gets substituted in as x. And so I get this is equal to t of x minus 1. Well, x is n minus 1. n minus 1 minus 1 plus c1. Okay, so over here what we can do is we can say, hey, this is t 
t of n minus 2 plus c1, and I'm going to change colors here to keep things hopefully straight, plus c1. That's the, the purple substitution plus the original red c1. Now I haven't gotten rid of the equation on the right, but I've gotten closer to getting rid of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change colors here, and I'm going to substitute in again for that part. So that part is equal to t of n minus 3, because we get another minus 1 in there. t of n minus 3 plus c1 plus the purple c1 plus the original red c1. Now, this is starting to get a pattern here. If I keep doing this enough times, I should get down eventually to t of 0. If I subtract a constant amount enough times, n has to become 0. Whatever n you started off, I can subtract enough times. Well, if I do that, I'm going to get t0 plus c1 plus c1 plus, plus or sorry, plus c1. Now, how many times did we have to make that substitution? Let's call that k. How many times did I have to make that substitution? Well, I wanted to turn n minus something into 0. So I want, if I want t of n minus, uh, I want t of n to be equal to 0, I've got to subtract. I need t of n minus k. To get to t of 0, sorry, to get to t of 0, I need to do t of n minus k. I needed to do this k times. Well, wait a minute. If I want that, add that to be 0, I've got to do it. k has got to be equal to n. So if k has got to be equal to n, I've got to do this n times. So this gives me t0, t of 0, plus c1 times n. Now, I'm going to have to go sideways, which is equal to, I'm just going to reorder this, c1 times n plus, oh, and I'm going to substitute, t of 0 is equal to c0. And from this, hey, that, you probably looked at that last time. This tells me big O of n. I get rid of the constant on the largest term. I got rid of the smaller order terms. I'm left with big O of n. So that's our substitution method applied to this problem. Now let's go back to our interview question. I want to do this uh, power function with log substitute or with log number of multiplication. So here's our recursive function number one and recursive function number two. So the first one is the one that we just saw. The next one is it's a base case. All right. So yep, that part's the same. We got a base case. Good. Then it says let's take x to the n over 2 power. So if you were asking me for, let's say, x, let's, let's just say uh, x to the fourth power. Well, x to the fourth power, I'm going to get an intermediate result of x squared. If I took x squared and I multiply it by itself, x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. So if you believe me that this recursive function works, that when I call it with x squared, I get the correct result. Well, then, if I multiply x squared by itself, I get x to the fourth. So if my n here was 4, I make a recursive call to say, hey, calculate me n squared, multiply that out to give me x to the fourth, and then look at the last one here. It's saying if n is odd, okay, so if n was odd initially, I'd have to multiply by x one more time. If not, I don't, and I return the result. 
So let's think about this. What if this was x to the fifth? n divided by 2 is still 2, integer division. So I calculate x squared recursively. When it's done, I multiply by itself. I get x to the fourth. And then I say, oh, wait a minute, n was odd initially. Let's multiply by x one more time, which gives me x to the fifth power. So how do we believe that the recursive calls work? Well, the same way we just did it. What happens if I come in here in the recursive call, I'm going to get rid of my marks here, what if I have the recursive call of 2? I would say, okay, well, calculate me x to the first power. All right, well, wait, that's going to require another recursive call. Let's change colors this time. That's going to require a recursive call of x to the first. All right, well, in line 5, I say, well, calculate me x to the n divided by 2. 1 divided by 2 is 0. So I say calculate me x to the 0th power. Recursive call says, well, x to the 0th power is 1. Okay, okay, now I've got x to the 0th power is 1. I multiply uh, 1 by itself, and I get 1. Then I say, oh, wait a minute, n was... Uh, was n odd to the begin with? Yes, it was. n was odd because this is n to the first power. I've got to multiply by x. That gives me 2. I return 2 back to the level where we are in red here, and we're doing x squared. So now I've got 2 got returned by this line. I take 2, multiply by 2, and I get 4. Is n odd? No, because I'm on this n. I return 4 for x squared, which gives me 8, uh, which gives me 16 for x to the 4th, which gives me then gets multiplied by 2 for x to the 5th. So this one may take a little more looking at for you to believe me that this is working. So we've got our recursive call, and then we do multiply by the result, and then we check if the if n was odd, then we add no multiplication back in. Now there's our recurrence equation for that one. The recurrence equation for this one is a little bit more complicated. We've got to divide by 2. Every time I make a recursive call, I divide by 2. Now the constant amount of work here that I add when it's not a base case involves things like the multiplication, the is it odd, the multiply by, its, uh, by x if it is odd. Those are all a constant amount of work. That's our c here. Now I said I claim the complexity is log n. Let's prove. All right, so here's our code. Here's our recurrence relationship. Now let's make sure we're comfortable with the recurrence relationship. So it says, every time I want to solve n, let's make a recursive call with n divided by 2. So if I want to solve a problem of size n, I make a call on size n divided by 2, and then I do some constant amount of work. So we're going to have to substitute in. So we're going to write our recurrence relationship without the base case. t of n is equal to t of n over 2 plus c1. Now, I want to substitute in for that portion. Now, Let's go over on the right here. Let's write it down. t of x is equal to t of x divided by 2 plus c1. Okay, so now in this case, x comes in. What is x here? x is equal to n over 2. So then we need to call n over 2 over 2, which is equal to n over 4. All right, so this is going to be t of n divided by 4 plus c1. So we had n divided by 2, divided by 2. Master theorem coming up. Then I've got to add in the original c1. Well, n divided by 4, that gets me closer to what I want. Let's substitute in for that portion. That is equal to t of n divided by, wait, 
t of n divided by 4 gets divided by 2 again. That's t of n divided by 8 plus our orange c1 plus our purple c1 plus our original red c1. Now if I keep on doing this enough times, I'm going to get down to t of 0 because of integer division. Now why is it t of 0? Because my base case is 0. If my base case was 1, I would stop at t of 1. If I divide by 2 enough times, I'm going to get down to 1, and then I'll go to 0. How far I go in my substitution depends on the base case. Because my base case is 0, I stop when I get to 0. So I get to t of 0 plus, I'm going to have c1 plus c1 plus a bunch of c1s. How many of those c1s are there going to be? Let's call it k again. There's going to be k copies of c1. What we have to figure out is, what is k? So, let's do an example. Let's say I started out at 64. If it was 64, I would have to go to 32. Let's count on our fingers. I'll just make hash marks. So I went, I had to divide from 64 to get to 32. I had to divide by 2 again and get to 16. 8, 4, 2, 1, 0. So I had to make about 7 recursive calls to get down to the base case. That's approximately log n. It took log n, it actually took plus 1 there to get down to the 0. If I was stopping at 1, it would have taken exactly log n. Because I started with something that was exactly a power of 2. What if I started with something that wasn't exactly a power of 2? What if I started with, say, um, 20? 20 would get divided by 2 and become 10. Then 5. 5 gets divided by 2 and becomes 2. Divide by 2 is 1. Divide by 2 is 0. Took, okay, so it took uh, 10. 5, 2, 1, 0. It took about 5 times to get down there. That's, a, that's basically, we're looking at ceiling of log n. So if n, if n was of the form 2 to the k, then if we take the log of both sides, log of n is equal to k. So if it's exactly a power of 2, we're fine. If it's not exactly a power of 2, if, it wasn't, uh, if, if uh, n wasn't exactly a power of 2, it would take, basically, k would be ceiling of log n. So like I said, if when we use 20, 20 it took about 5 times, 24 would take about 5 times, 32 would take about 5 or 6 times, so it's about log n, ceiling of log n. So this is equal to c1 times log of n, oh, plus the base case, because that's our t0, remember, plus c0 gives me big O of log n. So that's how we do substitution with logarithms. And it might take some practice. It might take going back through this video again. Coming to office hours is fine. We'll be happy to answer questions about it. Okay, what about binary search? Well, binary search, we know it should come out being log n. The recurrence relationship is the same. Now, here I said big theta. Um, in If we're talking worst case, that's true. Best case could be better, so it could be big O. But if it's worst case binary search, it's big theta of log n. Because it's the same recurrence relationship, it's the same solution. What if we had a different problem? What if we cut it into three pieces? What if I cut it into two pieces, but I have to recursively visit both of them? That's where we're going to come up to the master theorem. So we've got a whole lecture coming up on the master theorem. Now, going back to tail recursion. 
So if a function is called, it gets a stack frame, stores the variables. Simple recursive functions generate a stack frame for every recursive call. If it's tail recursive, you know, we said a few minutes ago, tail recursive is when there's no computations pending after the recursion is done, tail recursion and iteration are equivalent. And the compiler will notice tail recursion. It will do the uh, generate code to reuse stack frames, etc. So here's an example. We took a factorial, simple factorial function that we used previously as an example. Here's a factorial with a um, recursive and here's a tail recursive one. Now what I did to produce this tail recursive function is something you probably haven't seen before. I could have done it with two functions. I could have done it with a starter function and a helper function. The starter function would just accept n, the helper function would accept n and an intermediate result. What I did here to fit it on one slide is to teach you something new. This is called a default default parameter. What this is saying is this function is okay with receiving one parameter or two parameters. If you give it one parameter, result starts at one. It gets a default value for the parameter. So what happens here is if we call it with one parameter, we, we're calling it with n. If we call it with two parameters, we're calling it with n comma the intermediate result. So default parameters have some rules. Default parameters must exist, if they exist, must exist from right to left. We can't say n has a default and result does not. Compiler won't accept that. If we had three parameters, let's say I had a equals 1 comma b comma c equals 2, invalid because defaults must be filled from right to left. I could have like int a comma int b is equal to 2 comma int c is equal to 3. That's valid because my defaults exist from right to left. So in this one, we have just one default parameter, the result. So what we're doing is we're using the result to do multiplication before the recursive call instead of after the recursive call. So we calculate n times the result before we call the factorial. And the factorial says, if n is equal to 0, return your intermediate result. Now let's watch what happens. Let's say we call this with, if I say uh, factorial of 3. Okay, well factorial of 3 comes in as basically factorial of 3 comma 1. It gets a default value. It says is n equal to 0? No. Return a recursive call of n minus 1. So this calls fact or actually, let me redo this. Okay, I'm gonna need more space. So I'm gonna draw it up top. So I called fact of three comma one. I called just factorial of three, the one got substituted in as a default parameter. So that calls factorial of two with result times n with three as an intermediate result. That calls factorial of 1 with 6 as an intermediate result. That calls factorial of 0 with 6 as an intermediate result again. n is equal to 0 is a base case which returns the intermediate result, 6. 6 then gets returned directly back to whoever called the original function. The recursive stack disappears because we can return back to the original caller, giving them the result 6. So that's how this works.
So this is our first version of Factorial that uses O of n time, but also effectively O of n memory. This one uses O of n time still, but it reuses the same stack frame over and over. When I drew it out, I showed you the calls that were called, but the stack itself didn't actually look like that. There was only one thing on the stack, but all of those recursive calls had to happen. So our tail recursive version here, still O of n time is the same, but only one stack frame. Now, does that mean this version is useless because we're going to overflow the stack? Well, not quite, because it turns out um, we can only calculate factorial of a fairly small n before we overflow the integer. We're going to overflow the integer long before we overflow the stack. Okay, here's another one, which we're not going to uh, look at right now. We're going to come back to this one later on. This is the binomial coefficient. If you've had stats, great. If not, we're not going to put it on the exam. But we're going to come back to this later on and analyze it again later on. This one is um, a definition of the binomial coefficient says, hey, if you want to calculate n choose k, like, uh, hey, I've got five different colored pens that I can choose from and I need to pick two of them. How many ways can I pick two pens out of five different color choices? That's what this calculates. And we're going to come back to that one later on. You don't have to worry about that now. The, um, oh wait, actually, let me just mention it. So when we write this one, we could write it iteratively with factorials. We could write recursively. There's a recursive definition of this. We could write tail recursively. And we're going to come back to this one later on in the semester when we get to like the last couple lectures. If you look on the schedule of topics, it's when we do algorithm families. We're going to come back to this one. So we still don't expect you. We're not going to test you on the binomial coefficients or how it works, but we're going to use it again as an example of complexity. Now, the rest of the slides in here are a reference on pseudocode. We are not going to go over them together. We are going to sometimes show you an algorithm in pseudocode. Sometimes we'll show you pseudocode and code. Sometimes we'll just show you code. Sometimes we'll just show you pseudocode. Um, we're not going to ask you to write some on the exams. We're never going to ask you to write pseudocode on the exam. We might give you pseudocode to read on the exam and possibly analyze, but more often we're going to give you code on the exam. Um, the, the downside of pseudocode is, we're just going to talk about this a little bit, is that the sometimes knowing the pseudocode, knowing the algorithm without an underlying data structure, without an underlying language, makes it easier to remember that. The downside to pseudocode is that there's no pseudocode compiler. There's no proof that your pseudocode is right. So we really have to translate it into an actual language to know that the algorithm does actually work. So you can look at the rest of these slides, but we're not going to be testing you on writing pseudocode. And rarely do we put any more reading pseudocode on the exam. Generally, we'll just give you actual code and ask you to do the complexity analysis of the actual code. Okay, so we're done actually here like two minutes early today. So I'm going to call the video done here and we'll see you in off hours probably with lots of questions. I'll stick around for a minute here in the stream and see if I've got any last minute questions that our staff hasn't answered yet. Oh, we're going to come back to palindromes. We're going to show you actually later on, we're going to show you a way to write palindromes with like two lines of code and use the STL. We'll do that later on. But we, we're not going to abuse you and make you do palindromes on the exam, but we are going to show you how to use the STL to be really cool about it.
Okay, I'll see everyone in office hours.